any private businesses. As you are standing at a private business that the stimulus helped, that is a particular kind of implicit lie. And the rest of us can see that lie as it is unraveled in real time by reporting. Even if you, the teller of that particular lie, do not seem chastened by the experience of being caught out, right? Here's another one. Mr. Romney spoke yesterday in the town of Defiance, Ohio. Part of why Ohio's economy has begun to bounce back is that we did not just let Detroit go bankrupt, as it were, right? The Obama administration bailed out the automotive industry saved the industry and it has roared back to life and the big three are hiring again well yesterday in defiance ohio mitt romney gave that obama administration success story a little mitt romney-esque tickle i saw a story today that one of the great manufacturers in this state jeep now owned by the italians is thinking of moving all production to china wow Mr. Romney saying, hey, don't get too comfy there, uh, Ohio, with the Obama rescue of the automotive industry. I know it's been better. He saved everything here, and that's why you have jobs and everything. But don't get too comfy there, Ohio. I read that they're moving all the jobs working for Jeep. They're moving all the Jeep jobs to China. He said that in Ohio on the campaign trail 12 days before the election. And it is not true at all. The real Jeep news that day was actually that Chrysler announced it was adding 1,100 new jobs in the U.S. Here, making Jeeps in Detroit, Jeep Grand Cherokees. And Chrysler says it could hire almost as many people for work at another plant in Warren, Michigan. In Ohio, Chrysler's investing half a billion dollars in its Toledo plant and hiring 1,100 workers. But Mitt Romney got up that day, got up yesterday in Defiance, Ohio, and says, you know, he read somewhere that Jeep is moving all of its production jobs to China, all of them. That's ridiculous. What is he talking about? It's embarrassing for Mr. Romney, right? I mean, why on God's great campaign trail would Mitt Romney get up in front of 12,000 people in Ohio and tell them the auto bailout actually hasn't helped you at all? Your jobs making Jeeps are going to China. I read it somewhere. Where's the story he says he read somewhere? We found it. Here it is. Uh, he was apparently trolling the nether regions of the right-wing press. He found it on a Washington Examiner blog post, which reported, uh, quote, Jeep, an Obama favorite, looks to shift production to China, a move that would crash the economy in towns like Toledo. Is this true? This is not true. This is a conservative blogger's misreading of a Bloomberg report that actually was reporting good news for Jeep. The Bloomberg report was that global demand for Jeeps has risen to the point where the company can sell more of them in China. And it wants to build Jeeps for China in China. This is good news for an American company, not bad news. They're not shipping any American jobs overseas. This doesn't mean less work for Americans. This means they're just adding, they're expanding overseas. Thanks to the auto bailout that Mitt Romney opposed, Chrysler stuck around long enough to win again. Yay! Or as Mitt Romney put it, Jeep, now owned by the Italians, is thinking of moving all production to China. Look, I, I, I cover campaigns for a living, right? I understand that politicians inflate and conflate and duck and dodge and weave and even dissemble sometimes. That is not what Mitt Romney is up to here. Mitt Romney is just flat out lying to the voters of Ohio and by extension to voters all across America on the basis of something he happened to read in the right wing blogosphere. His lie is embarrassing, frankly, and it should be unsettling for the rest of the world. I mean, imagine Mr. Romney waking up in the Lincoln bedroom or whatever, checking his conservative Twitter feed and then just running with whatever he finds there. Hey, I read somewhere that Russia did a thing. You know, and, and Mr. Romney is not wising up here. He made that same kind of mistake when he tried to say in the second debate that President Obama had not said the word terror when he talked about the Benghazi attack in the Rose Garden the day after the attack. The president had, in fact, used that word. But if you read the conservative blogosphere and the conservative blogosphere only, that never happened. And that apparently was enough of a fact check for Mitt Romney. That's what he read, so that's what he believed, so that's what he tried to use, and what turned out to be a humiliating gotcha attempt that failed before the largest possible audience, right, between 50-something million people watching him fail in a presidential debate. I'm the president, and I'm always responsible. And that's why nobody's more interested in finding out exactly what happened than I did. The day after the attack, Governor, I stood in the Rose Garden and I told the American people in the world that we were going to find out exactly what happened. 
that this was an act of terror? I think it's interesting. The president just said something, which, which is that on the day after the attack, he went to the Rose Garden and said that this was an act of terror. That's what I said. You said in the Rose Garden, the day after the attack, it was an act of terror. It was not a spontaneous demonstration. Is that what you're saying? Please proceed, Governor. I, I, I want to make sure we get that for the record, because it took the president 14 days before he called the attack in Benghazi an act of terror. Get the transcript. It, 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 he did, in, in fact, sir. So let me, let me call it an act of Can terror. Can you say that a little Garden. louder, you Candy? Word- you know, they never took back the, the Rose Garden thing. They never corrected that. After Mitt Romney said in front of 50 million people, you never said terror. They never took it back when he was proven wrong. They never took it back, at least they haven't taken it back yet, when he said that Jeep is planning on shipping all of its production to China. It's not at all true. He said it on the campaign trail. He has not taken it back. They never took it back about the American Springwire factory where he was making the case that President Obama hasn't been tough on China when he's speaking at the, com- at the company that asked the Obama administration to get tough on China, and they did, and that's in part why the company is still there. They never took it back on the stimulus company. The, st- the company that benefited from the stimulus, while Mr. Romney was there talking about how no companies benefited from the stimulus. They never take these things back, right? I mean, and it is, it, it's okay for your, your uncle, who watches Fox News all day and yells at the TV, to say, I saw that story somewhere, right? But when you want to be president of the United States, you can't keep proving that your first line of intelligence is the suffocating, oxygen-free right-wing blogosphere. And that something that you read on a right-wing blog that isn't true ends up going directly into a presidential candidate's speech. Stuff is not true just because you read it somewhere. And yet twice now, in the closing weeks of this campaign, we have seen Mitt Romney operate that way. Democrats and the Obama campaign believe they see an end game here, connecting these different kinds of Romney campaign problems that the Romney campaign never corrects itself. The Democrats now, you can tell, believe that they can sell the voting public on Barack Obama as the candidate you can trust to tell you the truth and to believe what he says against Mitt Romney as the candidate you cannot trust. Integrity has become the Democrats' issue now. Integrity and trust, that's their closing argument. Back during the Republican primary, the Obama campaign was reportedly divided on strategy. They were divided over whether they were going to try to hold Mitt Romney to the severely conservative positions he had to take in order to win the primary, whether they should try to make him seem like the extreme conservative he declared himself to be in order to get the nomination. The Obama campaign was divided between that strategy and whether they were instead going to try to make Mitt Romney seem like a flip-flopper, a human weather vane who would say anything depending on what he needed to get by in just that moment. They chose the former, right? They chose to try to hold him to the conservative positions that he took in the primary. But now, as it comes down to the final vote, Mitt Romney is just abandoning all of those positions, from reproductive rights to health reform to Afghanistan to his own tax policies. He's abandoned all his own policies in a way that actually makes all of those policies less relevant. Those positions themselves have become less relevant. And what has become relevant is his willingness to abandon them, his willingness to walk away from anything, to never mind the record, don't bother correcting it, don't bother being consistent, hope nobody checks, say anything. His integrity is essentially the Democrats' closing argument. The presidency is all about who's going to fight for the American people every single day, even when you've got to make tough decisions that are unpopular because you have some compass about what this country can be. And... uh, And, you know, I've, during the course of these four years, there are all kinds of mistakes that I've made every single day. But my compass has been true, and I've focused on, you know, what's going to be best for the American people. My compass has been true. For the Democrats now, in these last 11 days, integrity has become the closing argument. Integrity and trust. Joining us now is Steve Kornacki. He's co-host of MSNBC's The Cycle, and he's a senior writer for Salon.com. Steve, thank you for being here. Thanks for having me. Um, Can you close an election on this kind of sell line about trustworthiness and integrity? It is no longer an ideological argument from the Democrats. They're essentially saying judgment Romney for his character. 
I think it's an experiment, and I, I don't think we know the answer, and obviously we will on Election Day, because what Mitt Romney is attempting to pull off here is something I don't think we've really seen before um, in modern politics. This is a, a move to the middle sort of on the cheap. Um, it's coming very late in the campaign. It's rhetorical in nature. It's not substantive in nature. Um, it, it, by, for comparison, think back to 2000 uh, when it was Bush versus Gore. And the Republicans made a calculation after eight years of Clinton that they'd been too far to the right in the 90s. They needed to be in the middle to win a national election. They needed compassionate conservatism. So Bush they sort of saw as their Clinton. But what Bush did was he spent 1999 and 2000 developing a real program. Um, they, they later called it big government conservatism. But he had a real plan there for a, a greater federal role in education. He had a real plan there for a federal role on prescription drugs. They developed a real vision for you know, a moderate vision, a, a Republican vision of, of sort Comprehensive of, immigration reform. Exactly. Yeah. So this is what he ran on in 2000. So there was some real substance there. Um, the, the, what Mitt Romney is doing right here, it, he was far to the right in the primary. He gave the conservative base everything it wanted in the Republican platform. This is one of the most Republican, conservative Republican platforms you've ever seen. He did nothing at the convention uh, uh, from a policy standpoint to move away from that. And he waited all the way until October 3rd a month before the election to start in a debate to articulate moderate sounding outcomes, not policies, but outcomes, things that sound pleasing to moderates that are not backed up, but he has not changed his position on anything that I can really see. So I, I, I'm struggling to think of a precedent for this. It seems to me if that idea of you can't trust this guy, the idea that you, know, you don't want a weather vane like this being president, if it's ever going to work against a candidate, it would have to work now because I've never seen one that's this cheap before. Have you ever seen that particular attack work on another candidate, though? The idea that this guy is is essentially morally flimsy, substantively useless. He was somebody is a chameleon, he'll do whatever needs to be said, uh, and that you can't take him at his word. Has that ever been, I guess, stuck on a candidate in a way that they couldn't um, slough off? Well, it can, be, it can be stuck on a candidate in the sense of their, it raises their personal negative rating. And that's what was happening to Romney all year until October 3rd. Um, and that was for a variety of reasons. Some were just the gaps and the missteps. But I mean, he, had, he was the first candidate through September, um, a major party nominee in modern history who had a negative personal favorable rating. And I think that clearly was dragging down his support in the national polls. That's why he didn't lead at all until October 3rd. Um, the, the, the wild card here, sort of the change that took place in October, when people, the, the biggest statistic that jumps out to me about October is people really started judging, swing voters really started judging Romney, the winner, on the economy. And he's opened up now a high single-digit lead over Obama again on the economy. If that overrides their concerns about his personality and his character, then there's not much Obama can do. But they had luck, you know, with, Ob with uh, Romney's personal negatives before that, so there, there's been potential there, I would say. I wonder if the, um, I was thinking about this with the, the appearances in Ohio, looking at the economic numbers in Ohio. And of course, it's been funny at the personality level to see Ohio Republican Governor John Kasich try to talk to Ohio about how much things right. have gotten better under his leadership right. and to have the Romney campaign saying, can you shut up about that for a while? We'd really prefer to say things here are very badly, uh, are going very badly. As the, um, as the campaign really shrinks down to a very small number of swing states, and they do have that improving economic numbers problem, as it were, on the Republican side in places like Florida and especially in places like Ohio. Does that change the type of argument they need to make about change, about why Mitt Romney is the guy who should be trusted to do things differently than Barack Obama, since under Barack Obama, things are getting better? Well, they're, they're hitting a bit of a dead end there. I think I, I saw Kasich, it was yesterday or today, actually said, you know, basically things are on the upswing in Ohio, and to keep it going, you need to change leadership in Washington. <laughs> that's, a, that's a strange, you know, kind of incoherent right. message. And it is true, if you look at the numbers in Ohio, and I think this is true to a certain extent in Wisconsin, but really in Ohio, if you look nationally at where Obama's been bleeding support, it's, you know, working class white, whites, especially white guys, um, not as much in Ohio, not nearly as dramatic. And I think you can definitely link that to the economy there, to the bailout there. And, and I can think of just, it, it's a small example, but I think the 1988 election, Bush versus Dukakis, this is a sea of red on the electoral map. Bush won coast to coast, 40 states. Um, there were three states in the upper Midwest in this ocean of red that went Democratic. Now, it was Iowa, Minnesota, and Wisconsin. Um, and it was because the farm economy economy had collapsed in the mid-1980s, and the economy was so much worse there than the rest of the country that, that they wanted to take it out on the Reagan administration, and so they turned on Bush and they voted for Dukakis that year when everybody else was going, uh, was going for Bush. So I see there's a potential there for kind of a flip of that. If the economy is so uh, is strong comparatively in Ohio, and the auto bailout has helped it in a way it hasn't helped other states, I could definitely see, and it would probably explain why Obama's doing better in Ohio than he is you know, nationally.
Steve Kornacki, host of MSNBC's The Cycle. Thank you very much for joining us here tonight. Do you feel like between now and uh, the election, it's essentially just one sprint? Like, do you plan to, to sleep or take any time off at all? Uh, I, I haven't been so far, so why right. change now, you know? <laughs> Steve, thank you. It's great to have you here. Sure. All right, it is a pretty good bet that you have not seen uh, the most moving speech by a politician in the last 24 hours. Actually, it's probably the most moving speech by an American politician in a while. Uh, we have the video tonight. I do not think it has been anywhere else at all. Uh, but we're going to play it here for you tonight. Uh, it's a, a pretty good chunk of tape. So we're going to play it at length because it's worth it. It's truly emotional stuff, and that's coming up on the show tonight. Stay with us.